morning Vegas this is Brahm Gupta CEO of RoboMQ and I have the pleasure of having Johnny Bynum enterprise architect of Topgolf in this session we're gonna go over the shared journey that Topgolf and RoboMQ started two years back Topgolf had the vision of cloud first architecture they had tremendous growth in last two years they grew from 15 venues nationwide to 37 and now they're going international offering their unique RFID based gaming experience in a franchising model, Top Golf in a Box. RoboMQ had its own share of growth, starting off as Message Queue as a service, and now we are the multi broker, fully distributed hybrid integration platform that is built up on the strength of microservices and containers. Without further ado, I invite Johnny Bynum to share his story with you all. So, what is Top Golf? Uh, show of hands, how many folks have been to a Top Golf venue? Wow, okay. Good, good, yeah. So maybe I don't need to spend too much time on this slide. Um, so I work for Topgolf, Enterprise Architect, and Topgolf is a, a global sports entertainment company. Um, at our venues, you can hang out for those that haven't been to one. You can hang out, you can hit golf balls, uh, you can play some really cool games. We have RFID tags embedded into the golf balls, and they go into targets that are red, and uh, you get a score based on that. Uh, you can also hang out with your friends, you can eat, drink, be merry, it's a good time. Uh, we have one of our flagship locations here in Vegas over at the MGM Grand. So as Brown mentioned, we're growing and we're growing quite rapidly. Uh, we went from 15 venues to 37 in the last two years. We're growing globally as well. Um, in 2018, we'll be in Australia. Uh, we're already building the site and uh, we're putting in the technology. Uh, and then that's gonna be quickly followed by Canada and Mexico. We have 16,000 employees. Um, whenever I say this, most of the time folks are kind of surprised by that number because um, a lot of folks don't know about Topgolf, but the ones that do um, are surprised by that number because it's, it, the number of folks that it takes to support a venue is quite high. Uh, we're on target to reach 20,000 next year. We have over 65 back office integration flows. And uh, you know, just to uh, kind of pile onto this, uh, we're looking at replacing our POS, HRIS, and ERP systems as well. So growth equals change. So let me tell you a little bit about the architectural approach we use at Topgolf. So my design philosophy is that code always wins. You may have heard Mark Zuckerberg say something similar where uh, code wins arguments, right? But the concept is, whatever you deploy, that's your design. I mean, that's, you can't get any more concrete than that. Um, so the question then becomes, was your design intentional? Or was it just purely functionally driven, right? Um, so at Topgolf, we use a form of attribute-driven design that's uh, put forth by Carnegie Mellon. It's, it's a form, it's a scaled-down form. Uh, they're heavily funded by the Department of, of Defense, so it's quite rigorous and structured, but uh, we use a form of that. Uh, and it's all in, in an effort to get the business drivers the, and create non-functional requirements from those business drivers. We call those things key quality attributes of our architecture. And then we use uh, tactics to uh, meet the key quality attributes of the architecture, and the tactics are realized as patterns and technologies, right? Um, and then I just want to call out that uh, there's always trade-offs. Uh, I think there was an earlier presentation this week where uh, there was some discussion about shiny new things. Well, even shiny new things, you know, have trade-offs associated with them. So I like to always remind folks that uh, what are the trade-offs with these shiny new things? So, you know, microservices have their own trade-offs, which we'll get into in a minute. But uh, we like to carve off some time and just really think through what are we actually trading, right, when we're making decisions. So I mentioned uh, there's inputs into the design, right, business inputs, business requirements. Um, this book in particular has had uh, some good influence on the design philosophy that we have. Um, exponential organizations. Highly recommend the book. Um, the, the key concept with the book is that, you know, most of the intelligence doesn't live in your organization, it lives outside your organization, right? 
So how do you put the processes and technologies in place to um, be able to scale and include uh, other contributors into your systems? I think the, key, the other key call out here is meshing of public and private API data to, to create more value. So just uh, real quickly, the inputs into our design, I mentioned tremendous growth, legacy system support. Um, we have major new integrations coming. We've got to keep millions of guests happy and 20,000 of our closest friends or coworkers happy as well. And uh, our CTO has made it extremely clear that speed and innovation need to be you know, at the top of the list here. So given these inputs, uh, what would you do? You know, what, what kind of design would you come up with? Would you take a couple years off and roll out some big bang event at the end of that two years? Well, if you've been in IT for any length of time, the answer to that question is no, All right? So here's the, here's the notion that we went for. Uh, this is our talk off DXP. Um, the key call outs here are the service fabric at the bottom and the ESB on the side. The service fabric is a broker uh, that runs on-premise and it uh, is the glue between the microservices that you see in the venue platform layer. Uh, that's just an example of probably 20 other microservices that we have. Um, and then the other call out here is that service fabric and the ESB is the reason I'm on the stage right now because these services are provided by RoboMQ and Brom can talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then I mentioned the XO book, Ex Exponential Organizations book. That's the reason behind the API framework. We're going with Kong, open source um, API gateway. Uh, we use Swagger docs and dev processes to facilitate the APIs. So what are the trade-offs? I mentioned trade-offs, right? We spend time thinking about them. Um, the, the microservices architecture there's definite trade-offs there, and I like to bundle them into, there, there's a bunch of them, but here's a couple, right? There's more things to manage when you start decomp decomposing your monolith. Um, and then, if you're going with an event-driven architecture, uh, you've got to manage that complexity. It's going to introduce, they can and will introduce more complexity to your overall system. Um, so I, I kind of bundle those up into a term I like to call distributed systems tax. So what do we know is true about taxes, right? Um, they sneak up on you and you have to pay them. So I think this is uh, quite appropriately describes uh, some of the trade-offs you're getting into. So with more things, uh, should you use Rancher? Should you use Kubernetes, right? We, we talk about these things all the time. Um, the events, you know, how do you manage the versioning of events? Event notifications, you know, how much data should propagate when the events are happening? Um, so all these things need to be questioned and thought about. So in keeping with a, a theme from an earlier keynote uh, presentation this week where there was a reference to a steaming pile, uh, dung heap, right? Um, the, the question really is, how do we get from this, a monolith that's been broken out and decomposed into, uh, but is taking on the distributed systems tax to something that looks more like this? microservices that we cherish and love and get real value from. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Johnny. Mm -hmm. So one more thing, like uh, what Johnny said, it's a huge scale of operation. I mean, 13 million of vis visitors visit their locations every year, and billions of balls are hit, and all of this is happening in the menu. So there's a lot of events, a lot of interaction happening right in the venue with their system, and their venue is more like a data center, if I will say that way. So jumping into RoboMQ. <coughs> RoboMQ is a hybrid integration platform. As I said, we started off as a message queue as a service. We are still built on the strength of guaranteed delivery of message-oriented protocols. However, we do support multi-broker approach, so you can run on AMQP, Kafka, Kinesis, uh, Azure MQ, and SQS. So you have options to do the enterprise-grade messaging using AMQP and MQ or you can also do the stream processing with Kinesis and Kafka, depending upon whether you are on AWS or you are anywhere else. It's built, very really distributed, with support for all protocol, any to any integration. 
the service mesh is distributed, which is a messaging transport layer. And as Johnny was talking, in their case, it is running in the venues, and the same flavor runs on the cloud, and they are in a, in a federated clusters. So there are clusters across the venues which are federated into the cloud. And the brokers are so miniaturized that they can run on a Chrome box. In fact, we had a, we have a, you can win a Chrome broker in a Chrome box if you download our broker on the Docker Hub. So we minimize it to that point because we also support IoT interaction. So when you look at hybrid integration platform, it's IoT, it's mobility, it's cloud, cloud service integration, cloud to ground, ground to ground or enterprise application integration. And everything is built as Docker and the services are all built as microservices. And you get a lot of those benefits, for DevOps benefit of the cost, scalability and expandability when you go with the microservices based architecture. This is a trend, trend toward composability. I mean, 1990 and earlier we had monoliths, which started breaking down into service-oriented architecture with web services, soap services, rest, and others, starting at the turn of the century. And now we are seeing more fine-grained, decomposed, choreographed services as microservices. But one thing to note is that it's never a clean-cut transition. We still have mainframes around, and a lot of big businesses, Fortune 500 companies are running on it. So we will see the, all these three flavors coexist for a long period of time. So architecture or an approach, both as a product vendor and also as an enterprise architect who's gonna take it for the business, has to look at the things where you can support all of these. And as a matter of fact, when we look at our own business, 40% of the interaction is still happen on file transfers. So that's why we have a user driven managed file transfer, you can drag and drop and build file transfer flows because they are so common in the business even today. Now, as I was saying, we moved from message queue as a service or the traditional integration middleware into a microservices based hybrid integration platform. This was the trend. We were moving, we are moving from application composition to a functional composition. We could take ERP, SAP, databases, Salesforce, and so on, and integrate them. That's application integration or integration middleware use case. From there, we are moving to functional integration because now integration has to be taken for granted with the distributed nature of the systems, cloud, services, all those kind of things. And then you, you are having these architecture coming in with microservices, Docker, uh, Kappa architecture, Lambda on AWS, Google Cloud Functions. So we are moving toward this trend and it needs to support and that is supported by a service mesh, which is kind of a mesh of brokers or it's kind of a fabric which transport messages versus a single service bus which could fail under this kind of pressure. Now jumping to another thing that we have in our product is the visual workflow designer called integration flow designer. The difference between that and the traditional BPM solutions is it's a orchestrator versus a choreographer. It's a choreographer versus an orchestrator. Traditional BPMs have been more like an orchestrator. There's something or the BPM running in telling what things should happen to get a flow executed. Whereas in a choreography, the independent uh, atomic and autonomous microservices know what to do. They know their own dance. It's just like going to a ballet. There's nobody on the stage telling the dancer to do what. So we have built our flow designer in a way that it is a choreographer of microservices versus or orchestrator. Another thing is this functional expandability. That's a great benefit, comes out of this architecture of microservices. We have cases where even in top golf scenario, we had flows which we built a couple of years back and then we have been adding functions to it because things change, the business models change. They moved to states where there were different regulatory requirement for employee management or payroll processing, those kind of things. So that the, the approach of chaining versus changing the function and being able to expand, being able to bifurcate the flow into different stream of processing, that allows you to be very nimble and very scalable as a business and that comes out of the microservices architecture. The service mesh, the one I, was, uh, I have mentioned earlier is, it's a multi-cloud, multi-region, you can deploy anywhere. It's built, the brokers are built as Docker containers. That's the reason why you can run it on any cloud. We run on all four major clouds. You can run it in private data centers, and then these, these are federated. 
they have federated rules. So you can process things locally, you can process things globally, and you can have this uh, cloud service integration as well as cloud to ground integration. And think of it more like a LAN versus a van. You want to have the traffic and data interchange happening where it belongs, and then move it to the next level where it is needed. And it offers all the message-oriented middleware things like buffering, cache, and the guarantee delivery. This is one example of implementation of the service mesh and distributed processing at Top Golf. So the boxes at the bottom, these are the venues. These are the venues where you have the broker running or clusters of broker running which are federated to the cloud broker which is on the top and the messages are being transported across the local systems as well as if it needs to talk to say ADP or Salesforce or ServiceNow or applications running on AWS, then it can federate over the federated link. At the same time, you see those hexagons or the microservices. The microservices are also running locally as well as globally. You can also have scenarios where you can process, let's say you have a flow, workflow, which is made of six microservices. Five to seven is more typical made of six microservices, you can run three of those locally because the data processing that you're doing in your data center is sensitive about security, about the kind of data that you're pushing in. And then you can make a call into say Salesforce where you're going to over the cloud, but then you're not constrained by your PII or CPNI, those kind of requirements. So this flexibility allows you the processing as well as it allows you to meet the regulatory requirements that come with some of these kind of interactions. Now, with my running microservice, another thing comes, okay, where do we run? How do we run? There are multiple options. The most common is just run it as Docker containers, right? You have a Docker host, you can run it. Docker itself, base Docker engine provides auto healing, so you can always say that services can start. You can also run multiple instances, but you still don't get certain capabilities like uh, scaling on demand. When certain things happen, load goes up, do you want to scale on demand? Now, when you want to scale on demand, how do you add resources to the pool to support it? So as the number of microservices goes up, I want to add more compute resources into the mix so that I can support that load. Now, those kind of capabilities are offered by container orchestration platforms like uh, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos, and if you're following this space, it's like very fast evolving, right? Docker is supporting Kubernetes at the core. They also have Swarm, so I don't know how that's going to shape out. Mesos is a great platform, very stable, has been around for some time. So that's an evolving space, but however, all of these will do certain common things, like ability to run containers, ability to scale to meet the demand, and able to virtualize multiple compute resources into a one big pool where microservices can run. The, one more thing to note is difference between container orchestration versus service choreography. That's often confused. When you're talking container orchestration, you're talking about managing the life cycle of containers, managing how many microservices are, managing the auto scaling, managing the auto healing, managing putting more resources into the mix to support that. When you're talking service choreography, you're talking about the data flow between the service, the service knowing what to do, service knowing where to pick the information from, where to drop it. So the container orchestration is provided by these platforms. Where service choreography, that's provided by the tooling and the service mesh, the messaging fabric that we have as part of the platform. Event-driven architecture, that's as Johnny was talking, like things are happening in the venue, walls are being hit employees are being hired, sales transactions are being, all, each of these are events. Traditionally, we have been focused on data. Data was a kick. I think the event is more important because it is the event that generates data. Data is just uh, metadata about an event. The platform at the core is built around event processing. It's an event processor. Yes, we have connectors to REST, so, so are web services and so on because those interactions are going to happen, but it's not a passive system as SOA. SOA is passive because you have to make a request to get a response, whereas word is not request response driven. Word is event driven. Something happens, that triggers a chain of event. For example, this is from top of use case, a large event sales happens, somebody makes advanced payment. 
that the payment event, sales event goes in, gets semantically linked, and you can build the data warehouse in near real time without doing ETL, and the data is clean and semantically linked. The same thing has to go into point of sales systems because somebody has already made a booking, somebody has already paid the money. So sales systems should know that I have to adjust this much money which the person already paid. And then food and beverage systems have to be up updated and then the restaurant operation has to be aware, okay, this is order already. So, so as you see, the, just the act of signing a contract creates all these subsequent flow, which are data flows, but they are actually events. One event triggers another event, which triggers another event, and so on. Data is just a metadata about those events. So that's a that's an important thinking. If you look back here, thinking from data centric approach to an event centric approach, and this is going to be the big thing as we get into this microservices architecture. Even driven, even Gartner is like tracking it as a one of the very emerging trends in this space. Observability patterns, and that's something you have to have. If you have a platform which has, which is running operations for large enterprise that is scale, you have to have observability patterns like error analytics. So what we have is any time a service throws an exception, it gets into the error exception handling process. So it gets, you can have email, SMS, Twilio, case being created in ServiceNow or Jira so that somebody acts on it. Then there's also analytic information created. There are dashboards. You can, it's, a, it's an admin dashboard as well as a dashboard which you can monitor how the platform is performing. Then with containers, another thing comes is so many number of containers. So let's say a flow has seven microservices and you are running 50 flows, you are running 350 microservices. Each of these microservices are doing the processing, they're generating docs. Something is happening good, something is happening bad. How do you look at those docs? That's a nightmare to manage. That's the tax which Johnny was talking. So in order to solve those, you can have a centralized container logging that we offer. So all these containers, wherever they are running, they're sending the logs into a centralized location where you can analyze, look at the things, you can run queries on it. So that's uh, container logging. Then container health checks. Each of the container is consuming resources, it providing some kind of statistics about the memory, CPU, is it live, not live, those kind of information. So we have the mission control which tracks the containers and all these things are embedded in the smart container that we have. And then analytics for the IoT analytics. This is important because some of it drives a lot many things in the product. So two problems. One is, okay, if you have a container, a microservice, you need so many things around it. You need business activity monitoring. You need encryption decryption. You need uh, event health checks. There's messaging involved. Now, you can do all these things, but that adds to the cost. So we built this smart container, which at, at its shell, on the, this is on the left side of the picture. At its shell, it has all these capabilities built in. So you don't have to worry about which messaging protocol you're using. You don't have to worry about encryption decryption. You don't have to worry about the container logging. You don't have to worry about even other exceptions. You just have to worry about writing your business code. So the business code written in the middle, let's say it throws an exception. It's a Java code, throws an exception, that's it. You throw an exception, exception is gonna get caught, and then there's a whole things on the platform, like sending notification, creating tickets, setting it into other analytics, sending it to Leo, sending a Slack message, all those things are built in. So we have encapsulated these, or abstracted these functionality into the container itself, and you build on top of it so you get the benefit of all these capabilities. The second problem comes is, okay, every microservice need a configuration, because there's gonna be information like database uh, credential, there's gonna be information about how the service will operate, the config information, there's gonna be information about the choreography. How do you deliver it? You can code in the container, or you can mount it on the system which is running it on the host. And that creates a problem of scale, because then you have configuration and credentials spread all over where services are running. To solve that problem, we took something from the telecom world, like if you turn on your phone, it pulls down a profile, and once it pulls down a profile, it knows who it belongs and what are the features, services, etc. Same with the microservices, when they run, they talk to the bootstrapping server, and they identify themselves that I'm part of this flow, and on this microservice, give me my payload so that I know what I need to do and I know my choreography, how I need to dance. 
and that information is securely delivered. So in our tool, which is Flow Designer, it's not a BPM, but you just configure these things, the configuration is saved, and then whenever microservices run anywhere, any cloud, anywhere on the network they run, they get the profile, they get the choreography, they get the configuration, and they can do their tasks. So that's implemented through the config uh, bootstrapping, which does help in service de deployment and configuration management, and as you know, running IT or technology, this is a huge cost of operation. That's where most of the money goes in, running, managing, operating, that's where the cost savings are. And I'll hand over to Johnny to summarize the top golf. Yeah, <clears throat> so as you can see, they have quite an extensive offering, where WebQ does. Um, but I wanted to leave you with a few uh, summaries of my thoughts here. Um, so book recommendation, exponential organizations. I think it uh, has the potential to accelerate your organization. Um, consider uh, your services as your secret sauce or diamonds as in the presentation here that can be exposed to be, uh, can, you can leverage outside resources uh, in your organization with, right? Through APIs and, and different layers. Um, microservices, they have a distributed system stacks. Uh, think about this as you're decomposing, right? But evolve an optimal strategy for yourself. And then I guess the last thing here is consider a service fabric as the glue between your microservices. Uh, in this case, RoboMQ is a great option for a hybrid integration approach. So, thank you, Brian. And to summarize, there are two things which, if I have to do a takeaway, there are two things. One is the trends. There are trends in the industry, things are changing, the way things are moving. So what we did as we evolved as a product, we looked at the trends. We've been following the trend from in, just message queue as a service to microservices to a multi-broker supported hybrid integration platform. That's where we reached. And the second thing is problem, the customer problem. We looked at the customer problem, we looked at the challenges that Top World was facing, and we aligned our roadmap to solve those problems. Because the problems that they are facing are truly representative of the trends and the industry and how the business is going to move forward there. So that has, that has done benefit to us and we did help Top Golf in their journey and, <coughs> and that, that's how we are moving. We are still continuing to evolve, we're still trying to solve the problem and still trying to grow the product. I know I couldn't talk a lot about the product and feature and component because we wanted to talk about these challenges and the themes that we saw and we solved to it. But definitely, we'll be here. If you guys want to talk, have questions or talk about, you can ask the question. We still have a few minutes left. Otherwise, we'll stay here to, uh, to continue to talk to you guys. Thank you very much. And thanks for your time coming here. Hope you have had a good time here and have a safe flight home, back home. Thank you. Thank you.